Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. <coughs> it's the Ember Days, and so I want to talk about the priesthood. It's a clericus. Seems like an appropriate thing to talk about. I want to, my goal is to impress upon you the importance of your priesthood so that you fully appreciate your priesthood. And I realize not everyone here is a priest, but most of the, most of the men who aren't aspire to the priesthood one day. So we want to talk about the priesthood, and I want to, I want to sort of take uh, three stories from the Old Testament to talk about the priesthood. And to do that, I want to cover a couple familiar passages that I've talked about before briefly. And the first one is one I talked about at convention last year. And I, I even went back to the story of Saul for our consecrations. Um, this is again the situation where Saul is already king. Uh, he's So this is a situation, king, Saul is king, and uh, they're having trouble with the Philistines as usual, uh, not having much success, but his son Jonathan manages to have a success, and he wins a, a battle over a detachment of the Philistines, but all that does was was like banging on a beehive, because it woke the Philistines up, and suddenly there's a swarm of uh, Philistines, and the Hebrews are in terrible shape because the Philistines had of, of taking their blacksmiths and their, their fighting tools. So really the only ones with proper equipment to fight is Saul and his uh, son, Jonathan. And uh, so at this point in time, the prophet Samuel uh, leaves Saul and he's like, I'll be back in a week. And uh, when I get back in a week, we'll take care of sacrificing the Lord and everything that needs to get done. And Saul is there, and he sees people are afraid, you know, they're, they're hiding in holes and caves, and they're all terrified. And uh, it, it gets to be exactly a week, and Saul says, eh, whatever. We don't need Samuel. And I want to read uh, from uh, 1 Samuel 13. And King Saul tarried in Gilgal seven days, according to the time set uh, by Samuel. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him, because they were fearful. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And King Saul offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an offering of the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him, actually bless him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattered from thee, and thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over, over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So, the prophet Samuel, who was a Levite, left Saul for a week and said when he returns, he'll offer the sacrifice. The week goes by, they're here fearful. Saul takes it upon himself. After all, he was a king. That Samuel is just a prophet, just a Levite. I'm the king. So he offers the sacrifice, and no sooner does he do it than 
Samuel walks up. And then to take the role of masquerading as a priest one step further, he goes out to bless Samuel when he arrives. Samuel says, what have you done? And instantly King Saul knew he had made a mistake. I, I, I could imagine the prophet Samuel. <laughs> I could just, just picture his face because instantly Saul knows this is bad. What have you done? And he instantly starts making excuses, uh, Saul does. He blames Samuel. You know, the Philistines, are, they're all, they're, they're scary and everybody's upset and and he says, I forced myself to do it, you know. <clears throat> Samuel's response, you've done foolishly. You've overstepped the bounds of your tribe. You're a Benjamite, not a Levite. <clears throat> you have presumed to act as a priest, and you do not hold the office of priest. You thought you were offering a burnt sacrifice. You sacrificed your kingdom. A couple more incidents I want to put before you. A couple years ago, for your ordination, <coughs> I preached a sermon from Numbers, and I'm going to read a, a good section of that. I apologize, I don't like to read large sections of scripture in a sermon, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, <clears throat> uh, from Mo uh, we have a, the situation is Moses and Aaron are in the wilderness, uh, once again dealing with the burden of leading God's people. Leading God's people is not such an easy task. You can read all about it. But often it means dealing with sinful rebellion. The chief rebel in this case was a Levite named Korah. Korah was murmuring against Aaron. He wanted to be able to do all the things that Aaron did. We are all holy unto the Lord. They said, listen to what Moses says to Korah. Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also? Talking about the Aaronic priesthood. For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord? And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? So, the great distinction we see between the Levites and the sons of Aaron was not offering animal sacrifices, it was offering incense. In a sense, incense was the highest sacrifice. That's why love for us to offer incense. So, um, so they wanted to offer incense themselves. And so what you end up with is a big showdown between Moses and Aaron and Korah and his 250 rebels. So <clears throat> this is uh, starting at verse 18 in number 16. It says, and they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourself from Korah's congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up these censers out of the burning and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed, the censers of those men who sinned against their own souls. Let them be hammered into plates as a covering for the altar because they presented them before the Lord. Therefore they are holy, and they shall be assigned to the children of Israel. And Eleazar the priest took the brazen censers, wherewith they, were, they offered the burnt, off, the burnt, had offered, and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar, to be a memorial, i.e. a grave warning, 
to the children of Israel that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. They wanted to offer incense to the Lord like Aaron. Aaron thinks he's a hot shot. You know, we think people, they, they, you know, they wanted, to, they wanted to offer incense to the Lord. They should be commended. No commendation from God. They were consumed by fire. They despised their office as Levites and attempted to usurp the priesthood of Aaron. And they paid for it with their lives. They sacrificed their lives. The final incident I want to put before you is the usurpation of the priestly office by yet another king. Now this time it was King Uzziah. King Uzziah of Judah. He was a descendant of King David. He's listed in the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew 1. He's really one of the better kings. On the scale of the kings of Judah, he's, he ranks pretty high. He was a good king. But listen to what it says uh, in 2 Chronicles 26. Uh, the king was, was good, but he became proud. King Uzziah's fame spread far and wide. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah, the priest, went in after him. And with him were eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Good intentions aren't enough. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there was on his forehead leprous. He was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Mm. Once again, we see a king attempting to usurp the priesthood. King Uzziah, a good king, successful king. He gets proud, and his proud pride leads him to think he's above the law. He quickly finds out he isn't above the law. And the usurpation of the priesthood will not go unpunished. For his attempt to usurp, a, to usurp the priesthood and offer incense, he's a leper the rest of his life. I believe that, well, so we have in these three stories, three men, important offices, kings, Levites, but they were not content with discharging their God-ordained offices. They were God-ordained offices, for sure, but they weren't <laughs> priests. They weren't sons of Aaron. And for their, for their foolishness, they sacrificed a kingdom, their lives, and their health. Does God take our divinely appointed offices seriously? I would say so. It's tempting to, to, you know, look at these stories and that's the Old Testament. <laughs> right? That's the Old Covenant. Those were priests of Aaron. Those were real priests. What? I believe that is unsafe ground, brothers. <laughs> 
priesthood we exercise is a greater priesthood than that of Aaron. Mm. Mm. Our high priest is greater. His sacrifice is greater. And we exercise the priesthood not through types and signs. We exercise the priesthood in spirit and truth. The word made flesh and dwelt among us. We know the priesthood that we exercise. How valuable is your priesthood? How much do you value your priesthood? Consider the reaction of Samuel to Saul's violation of the priesthood. The horror. <laughs> You've done what? <laughs> Consider the seriousness that Moses placed on the integrity of the holy priesthood. He literally prayed to God against these people. <laughs> Get him! Don't let him do this! Consider the 80 valiant priests who withstood the king. If the, the guy uh, a little way up the road tried to usurp the priesthood, would we have 80 priests to defend it? It's clear all these men knew the priesthood was something that could not be infringed on it upon, and they would not allow it. The order of Melchizedek is superior to that of Aaron. We know this because Aaron paid tithes to Melchizedek and loins to Abraham. Our high priest is superior, and we, as his priests, are commanded to go forth and preach his gospel and administer the sacraments. And in doing so, we are engaging in the great work of reconciling the world to our Lord Jesus Christ. Your priesthood is infinitely more important than your secular job. It is more important than the current political scene. It's more important than your kid's softball team. And as much as I'd like to have a herd of goats, it's more important than a herd of goats. How can we not get up every day and be in awe of serving as priests in the one holy Catholic? Maybe, maybe if we give you a beautiful rectory, you'd, you'd value your priesthood more, huh? Maybe if we gave you a pretty uh, church car, a nice brand new Lexus to drive, would you value your priesthood more? Maybe if, maybe if you got validation from the world and the world said being a priest is an important thing, maybe you'd value it more. Shame on us if this is how we feel. You were called and accepted a uh, call to the priesthood. You knew full well that our Savior and all of uh, the apostles and the men that followed after them all suffered uh, for Christ. You knew that when you became a priest. You knew the world wasn't going to say, oh, you're so wonderful, you're a priest. Your priesthood was purchased with the most precious thing in the world, and that's the blood of Christ. And it's the most powerful thing in the world, the blood of Christ. It is! Don't ever disregard your priesthood. Do you, think about those 80 priests who rallied to defend the priesthood. Where are the people defending the priesthood today? When they would infringe upon the priesthood and ordain people to the priesthood who cannot validly be priests. Where are the people to defend it? Where are the well-meaning, uh, where are the people who would defend against the priesthood against Protestants who would say, we're all holy to the Lord. Just like Cor has been. We're all holy to the Lord. I'll admit to this, and I know it's true of you. We are all our own worst enemies most of the time. Mm -hmm. And when there's not an enemy at the door, we very often find a way to undervalue our priesthood. How do we undermine our priesthood? How do we fail to value it? <laughs> By refusing to exercise it. I've set very clear expectations of what I expect of our priests. I don't care if you have no parishioners, 
or 500 parishioners. You are to regularly be offering up the sacrifice, the Eucharistic sacrifice. If you're not doing it, you're undervaluing your priesthood. You're treating it as something cheap and invaluable. How, how else do you undervalue your priesthood? By coveting someone else's office. You're a priest! You can offer up the sacrifice. What do you need someone else's office for? Come on, man! It's terrible. How much do we see that stuff? King Saul sacrificed his entire kingdom because he wanted to act like a priest. Korah, 250 men got struck dead by God because they wanted to usurp the priesthood. Uzziah wanted to usurp the priesthood and spend the rest of his life alone as a leper. They sacrificed all of these things for an office that is inferior to the one you hold and you won't exercise it. You don't have to pretend to usurp the priestly office. You are in the priestly office. You exercise your priestly office under our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you not diligently exercise that office? Will you? 